thank you so much. I just want to say a few names of these relatives. Grandmother tree, grandfather tree, father tree, mother tree, tree people, the tree of life, tree of knowledge, the banyan tree, the bodhi tree, the cedar tree, the yew tree, the birch tree, the mother trees. Throughout our cultures, we have honored the trees. Through Judaism, Christianity, Buddhism, Islam, Taoism, Shintoism, Coast Salish, Kwakwakiwak, Haltzik, Haida, Isla, Simtian, the trees are always with us. They clothe us, they shelter us, they care for us, they soothe us. We see them as symbols of life, of wisdom, fertility, continuity, growth, understanding, hospitality, generosity, peace. Oren talked about peace, friendship, spirit, the mother trees. So I've spent my life studying these trees because this is where I come from. I come from this forest. I grew up here, I had my children here, I have two daughters who live and work in these forests. And through my lifetime I've watched, as many of you have, I was born in 1960, what's happened to our trees. And this, this is in uh, Nechanlith territory on Vancouver Island. And it's the site of one of the greatest protests um, in all of Canadian history in, in 2021. Now, what the people defending these trees were doing is they were saying, this is not right. This is the corporate takeover of our forests. And this is not right, it's killing us. And in fact, in British Columbia, we only have two to three percent of the tall treed ecosystems still standing. That is wrong. And I've spent my lifetime studying the impacts of this on forests. What this does, and it's well documented, it doesn't matter if you're in Canada or in British or in the United States or in South America, it doesn't matter where you are. What this does, not only does it crush our cultures, it crushes biodiversity, it crushes our carbon pools, it causes the fires that we're fighting today, it causes flooding, it causes so many knock-on effects. We've been documenting this for a long, long time, decades. Nobody really listened because the people that were in power or the corporate, corporate power, they were making a lot of money from this. And so the other, th you know, the other thing that they did is they replaced these incredible old growth forests with these places, the planted forest. And our work is showing us that, that these planted forests are sick. <laughs> You know, could you imagine living in a place like this? And so what I did in my grief of watching my forest disappear in front of my eyes is I became an academic scholar. I, I became a researcher and I started looking at the underpinnings of what made a forest because I thought, what are we doing? We're taking the very things that make a forest and we're ripping it apart. And so I started underground because that's where I love the most because I'm a child also of the underground world and I, I worked with these fungi that actually turns out are you know they underlie the entire forest floor and I was building on other people's knowledge ancient knowledge but I didn't know it at the time I was just trying to fight the corporate model of forest destruction and so what I did is I, I started tracing where nutrients went from through the forest floor. I, I used my tools that I learned as a scholar to try to understand what was that forest doing? Where was the energy going? What happened to it when we got rid of the old trees? And in my quest to do this, I found out that, you know, this, that these trees are in community. <laughs> oh, no surprise, right? The trees are in a forest and community, and they're actually communicating like a community does. Um, and I started, you know, watching how water, the precious water, the carbon, the energy, the nutrients were moving back and forth between trees 
as they were helping each other. They weren't in a, this massive, fierce competition like, like the corporate model said, that, you know, that trees will dominate each other. No, they actually help each other. They're community, they're social. And I actually went on and with my students, and keep in mind, um, I've worked with many brilliant students. I've had 35 graduate students, doctoral and master's students. I've had 13 postdocs. And we've all worked on trying to understand how this forest works, how these connections work. We've published over 200 articles in, in peer-reviewed journals. And so what we've figured out is that this forest doesn't, this is only half the picture. <laughs> when you're walking through a forest, there's this huge vibrant thing underneath called a network. And I changed, through our work, we changed how we viewed forests from a bunch of trees that we see above ground to a whole network of below ground connections. So my student, Kevin Byler, actually used molecular DNA techniques using microsatellites or short sequences of DNA to understand which tree differed from which tree. And in the below ground world, you need to know that because when you're working among the roots, you can't tell if that root is from this tree or this root. They're all entwined together. It's one big communal living down there. So we needed these DNA tools to identify and separate these trees. And then we needed to identify and separate what fungal individuals might be connecting these trees together. And when, when we did that, it took years. <laughs> it took years to make a map of this forest that didn't just look above ground, but it looked below ground. And so what you're looking at is actually a top-down schematic of what that forest now looks like. Instead of a bunch of individual trees, we found out they're all connected together. And we only looked at one fungal species out of 300 in this forest. So you can imagine if we actually had the time <laughs> to do this, that this place is intimately connected together. We found so many other things that are important things. The big trees hold most of the energy in the forest. It makes sense, doesn't it? The biggest trees in this forest, the three big ones you say, see, they hold about 50% of that forest energy. It, they're photosynthesizing, they're spreading that energy around. The other thing that we found is that the biggest tree is connected to 80% of the other trees in this forest. And that those big trees are supporting this incredible mycelium, right? This mycelium that is working its way through the soil, picking up nutrients and bringing it back to those trees. And then when the seeds of the old trees fall and they germinate on the forest floor, those little seedlings tap into that huge network supported by the old trees. The place is regenerative. It can't help but regenerate itself. It's full of life. Another thing that we found, which is no surprise, because when you're a scientist, you're sort of like, you know, a sleuth. You're going, okay, what, what else do I want to know about this place? Well, we looked at what those compounds are that are moving through the networks. It turns out they have the same stoichiometry, chemical stoichiometry, as the neurotransmitters in our brains. Glutamate, which is the main neurotransmitter, is what is mostly moving through this network. What would it be another interesting question? Well, if the seeds are all falling around these trees, would they know which ones are their relatives? Turns out that they do. They change their behavior depending on whether their relatives are nearby. Makes sense, doesn't it? So it changed things. As I started doing this work, of course, when it's in the, the libraries of the journals, of the publications, in the universities, you guys don't read that stuff, do you? No. <laughs> I don't even read that stuff. No, I'm just kidding. I, I just read what I have to. Um, so what I did is I actually thought, I'm going to bring this message to the people. And I wrote this book. I called it Finding the Mother Tree. Thank you. And boy, am I in a lot of trouble. <laughs> Because I, since I published this book three years ago, yes, it's been amazing. It landed on the New York Times bestseller list. It was, 
in the top 10 books in Canada for 2021. It's a celebrated book, but not by everybody. For three years, I have been enduring a backlash against this work for calling the tree the mother tree. I've been called a liar, a dishonest scientist. I've been called, I misrepresent, I misinform. I've been called dangerous. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. A mystic, an anthropomorphizer, a personifier. They even wrote to my university and said I had conducted academic misconduct and I should be fired. <laughs> Sounds like a threat, doesn't it? Well, it, it, it's laughable, but it's actually very hurtful. It hurts me. It hurts my children. It hurts my students. It hurts everybody who has supported me. I know that, and I'm healing from this. And, and I'm saying this because this is not just about me. <laughs> it's about all of us, right? It is, why is that happening? Well, I don't really understand, but I think it's got something to do with those clear cuts that I showed you at the beginning. So, this fungal network below ground, my colleague, my good friend, Dr. Teresa Ryan, who is in the audience today, who is a salmon fishery scientist of the Simpson Nation, brought to my attention the teaching of a Skokomish man named Subie. And Subie, he spoke of the ancient story of the tree people that tells how trees have much to teach us about their symbiotic nature and their diversity, and that under the forest floor, there is an intricate and vast system of roots and fungi that keeps the forest strong. That's an ancient story. <laughs> what I discovered is, is like, it's been known forever. It's, thank you. And this story is an important teaching because it teaches us about our alliances, our communal strength, our diversity, and how we're in this very strong web of life and that together we are stronger. Thank you, Subie. Okay, so we have taken this knowledge and we've created this massive experiment, a Week Nicola Mother Tree Project, Mother Tree Network, and we wanna to talk to you about it this afternoon. It is the biggest climate change experiment, in, in, I think, in all of the world. It covers a 900 kilometer gradient that goes from the American border all the way almost to the Yukon border. It includes about nine forests and we're building on that up the coast with the mother, mother tree network. And what it does is it challenges clear cut logging. And it says there's got to be a better way. We know these forests are re regenerative. <laughs> and we've tried all these different ways of working with the nations together to devise ways that we can tend the forest in a tender way. Not clear cut it, but find other ways that we can work with the trees and still get the clothing and the materials and the medicines and the plants. And what we found, I think you guys already know the results. The forest is a regenerative place. When you leave old trees behind, they create space for new trees. Brilliant. The homes of all the creatures are protected. When you leave old trees behind, they create habitat. They leave habitat for bears, for animals, for people, for plants, for plants that are our foods and our medicines. We can do this. <laughs> we can actually work with these forests so that they don't burn down. Right? Because they have all that resistance and res resilience built right into them. But we need to tend them. We need to tend them through cultural burning, through tending the understory when it gets too thick, to saving the old ones with their thick bark and their deep roots. It's all right there. And if we can tend the forest, we won't get these knock-on disasters downstream like flooding. 
Oh, okay, I'm just gonna end with this one story. It, it fits, it fits with what everything has been said today. So last summer I was in the Amazon with the Pachamama Alliance and Lynn and Bill Twist were there. Lynn and Bill Twist, where are you? And it was an incredible experience because I saw the forest standing up again. Where we went, the forest was standing up, not like my home where we flattened the forest. And we got to talk to a shaman, actually several shamans, um, but I wanted, there was one shaman in particular of the Sapara Nation, his name is Minari, and he had three messages or four messages, and I want to relay those messages, and they resonate with everything that's been said over the last two days. The first message is, with our knowledge systems, our ancient knowledge systems, our elders, the seeds, the trees, we have everything here to solve climate change. We have it here. And we cannot forget that. I mean, we have to get organized, of course. The second thing he said is, people are gathering all over the world and working together to bring this together and solve these problems. That's what we're doing here today, especially women's groups. The women looking after the plants and the seedlings and the children are doing that quiet work, not so quiet always. <laughs> and it's happening, and these mechanisms are falling into place. The, the third thing they said, it's going to be hard. You know, it's going to be a lot of work, but we can do this. We just have to get together and do the work. The last thing he said and <laughs> is that I want you to go back to the West, back to North America, and this is a message. And this is not meant for everybody. Every, most of you people know this. It's meant for my colleagues, my Western scientists, who have said, who's, by the way, the, the most recent article that came out against me this week was called questioning the mother tree. <laughs> so his message to that world, which is a powerful world aligned, even if they don't know it, in support of, because I work in this system, in support of what we've been doing on this earth, this corporate extractivism. Not all of them, not all of them by any means, but they're involved in it. Um, and so the, the message to the Western scientists and the Western extractivism is we need to work together, but you've got to remember that we're spiritual being, beings, and so are the trees. And there's a great deal of wisdom, and you need to return to that wisdom. So with that, thank you so much.